Um, thank you so much again for sitting down with us. Um, Josie is my co-host for the show. She wasn't able to be on last time, so she's going to take it away with the, the questions, uh, like the first half of the questions this time around. So if you sure. want to start off. Absolutely. So Kevin Klein's character, the psychologist turned veterinarian, Larry Fine, yeah. was an interesting puzzle piece of story when it came to the healing process of Melissa McCarthy's Lily. Mm -hmm. How did you go about conjuring him up and how important was it to nail their chemistry? Because it is basically the heart of the film in a way. Yeah, no, I really, I agree with you. And I think that's something that I'm not sure everybody always gets to, you know, the real relationship in this story, one of like, uh, that I, I always wanted to focus on was that relationship between the two of them, because I thought it was sort of a symbiotic relationship, right? I felt like, he was helping her and she was helping him. And I wanted it to make it somebody, I wanted to make that character somebody who wasn't like a traditional therapist. And, um, and that's why I sort of came up with that idea as somebody who had left traditional therapy, you know, and found another way to sort of express this empathy and kindness that they had inherent to them. Um, and so, I wanted her character to sort of help pull him back into our world, you know, and, and at the same time, uh, obviously he helps her in her animal problem, if you will, but to help her and, you know, find what she needs to move on. And um, so, yeah, you know, it was interesting. I, at one time, very early on, looking back on it, my notes, uh, I had them, his character was a school counselor, like a you know, grade school, middle school counselor, uh, advisor type. And, you know, I had one time I, I'd gotten surgery when I was in college. I had to get surgery on my ankle. I'd torn my ankle up. And uh, when I went to get the cast off, I, uh, I was in there in that waiting room. You know how they have those diplomas on the wall, you know? where they went to, so it had like board certified orthopedic medicine and right next to it, same doctor had a diploma from the University of Illinois School of Veterinary Medicine. And I'm like, what the hell is going on here? And so when he came in the room, I'm like, wait, you're a vet? And he's like, you know, you got, I'm almost a little bit mad at me. He's like, well, I used to be, you know, I'm not anymore, but isn't that a weird thing to hang up the vet diploma as well on the wall? I, I don't know why you would do that. But anyway, that always kind of stuck in my head. And so, at some point I thought of that idea, like, oh, wait, you know, maybe he's a bet. So there you go. Life takes its turns. And yeah, it really does. You know, <laughs> I mean, it's, you know, and a lot of people do change their careers at some point, you know, and, you know, for him, I, I'd worked in uh, mental health when I was in uh, going to school, uh, in grad school in particular, I was working at a psychiatric hospital and I did get to know some professionals that well, it, it, it's a very stressful world to work in. It's a very stressful career. And, you know, unlike other medicine and health treatment, you know, it, you don't always see the results of your efforts right away. And, you know, you can't see a blood pressure return to normal and, you know, you've done your job type of thing. And, and in mental health, uh, oftentimes progress is measured in, you know, tiny increments over time it's very glacial you know in its pace and so uh i felt like for this person you know it, it would make sense that uh, perhaps they thought they weren't doing enough they couldn't do enough and and so that's why they had left that field absolutely um circling back a little bit with her animal problem yeah <laughs> um lily's main conflict in the starling is the literal starling bird Right. And what turns out to be just a very literal fight between her territory and the Starlings territory ends up being more of a, an emotional battleground with the with the bird. Um, what led to the decision of having your protagonist make peace with that bird, with that conflict, right. rather than just kind of what she initially sought out, which which was to eliminate it? Right. You know, I mean, in that protagonist antagonist relationship, right, that you you know, everybody was trying to put the story together. 
you know, your, your protagonist is going to have to defeat your antagonist at some point. Um, but in this case, I never felt like, you know, that was quite possible, especially for what the bird represented to me in the story. Um, and that the best you could hope for, if you saw the, uh, if you came to understand the, the natural world as uh, being defined by a, a very um, sort of intransient set of rules, right? And um, that we were forced to accept despite our best efforts to ignore them or rationalize them somehow. Um, and, you know, in some cases, these rules seem just very random and very chaotic, and it's very difficult to accept them for what they are. And so I felt like for her, it was a matter of coming to peace with it. You know, for me, the, the, the final image in the film was always going to be her and Jack standing together with the, with the helmet on, you know, and, and it's like, okay, we can, we can step forward, we can move forward, but, you know, with an awareness that uh, in this world, um, we have to shield ourselves as best we can, but we have to keep move, moving forward. We have to find a way forward. Um, so, yeah, I, I felt like they needed to come to terms in, with the with the, what had happened to them, and um, there is a form of acceptance I think that allows us, even in the grieving process, to sort of move on. Yeah, as they're like both stories blend so well when you go back to the relationship, but also you did such a great job of blending comedy and that emotional turmoil. How did that come about? What moments did you feel that we needed that sort of relief because we were dealing with heavy subject matter, such as not just loss, but the loss of a child? Yeah, to the comedy of it, you know, I wanted the comedy to feel as natural as possible. You know, I didn't want it to be too absurd, but I do feel like the life on a daily basis can feel pretty absurd and the comedy that flows naturally from that, you know, should feel real and not contrived, and, you know, not a, not a big setup uh, just for comic relief. I was always, you know, thinking too with the story that uh, because it is such a heavy subject matter that, um, the comedy can sort of operate a little bit like a Trojan horse, you know, and help deliver that, like allows us in, you know, I, I feel like even having comedic actors cast in this role of, you know, doing uh, drama or delivering drama really helps because it, comedy is very disarming, you know, and then when you allow this sort of drama and tragedy uh, in and you deliver it, I think that the punch is much more powerful. And so, yeah, it's almost like, uh, you know, like my, <laughs> my grandfather used to put salt on watermelon, right? And, uh, you know, I was like, what are you doing that for? And I tried it and it was actually the salt made the watermelon even sweeter. You know, I don't know why it works that way, you know, on the palate, but uh, it's that sort of idea. Like, I'm gonna give you something that's really, you know, emotional but I'm going to, I'm going to sneak it in there. And the way to do that for me was comedy. And I think a, a little curiosity with that approach, did you always imagine um, having an actress who like in that role of Lily, who normally like has experience doing comedy? Ideally, ideally, like when they used to talk about, you know, who do you see? Cause like a lot of times when mm -hmm. the script was going around town um, and, and development or producers or even directors that you're meeting with or asking you questions that's one of the questions they will ask is like who do you see you know playing this which is kind of an intimidating question to be honest with you when mm -hmm. you're like a first-time screenwriter you know and you're sitting in a room and you're like gee what do I say you know do I <laughs> you know do I call out the, you know it does it sound too arrogant to to want a high profile you know, mm -hmm. after in this role, or am I going to be laughed out of the room, you know, type of idea. But honestly, you know, Melissa McCarthy, when you, I don't know if you've seen her in some of her other roles that she's done, you know, I, mm -hmm. I also think that comedy is much harder than drama, you know, yeah. right, I really do. So I, I feel like uh, just, you know, between us, we're not even between us, but I, I, I'm, I've never understood why comedy isn't more 
recognized and considered for awards, you know, at the end of the year. Like it was nice when Bridesmaids was nominated and she was nominated for Bridesmaids. And I think the, the script was nominated um, and rightly so, you know, I, I feel like sometimes we just ignore these great comedies that come out. And as a writer, when I look at them and I think how difficult, you know, it is to write good comedy, you know? Um, so for me, yeah, it was, it was really important because I felt like those were the, the harder scenes in a way, you know, to do, and to do well and to make them feel real and not to make them feel, you know, like two rubber chicken type comedy. Uh, you, right. did, you needed a, a comedic actor to do it. Yeah, and definitely that balance played off really well um, once again. Um, to close this off, um, I'm going to ask you this question again because I thought it was a really fun one. If you could write Netflix's next original movie, what genre would you like to dive into next? Oh, boy. I don't even remember what I answered last time. Um, the next genre movie. Um, did I talk about horror? You did not, actually. No. What did I talk about? Do you remember? You met, you mentioned sci-fi even... and you talked about um, oh, the yeah. DIY genetic testing, I think. Like genetics, genetic oh, splicing. Yeah. I was actually giving away some of my, like, you know how you always have like a notebook right. of stories and stuff you're working on in the future? I do have this one um, that I'm working on a little bit. It's one that keeps on coming, you know, I, I've set it aside and it just keeps on nagging me. It's like when you wake up thinking mm -hmm. about but uh, there is this whole world of DIY genetic engineering that's going on. It's really wild. There's a documentary about it on Netflix, in fact, if you ever want to watch it. Um, yeah, and it, it came out during the pandemic, so it's within the last year mm -hmm. or so. But um, some of these genetic uh, uh, engineers, if you will, uh, are they believe that this technology should be made widely available to anyone and everyone. Mm -hmm. I don't know why there's sort of these kind of radical uh, scientists. And so they're actually, uh, you can contact them and they will send you the kits. I'm being serious <laughs> here uh, and teach you how to do it at wow. home yourself. It's almost like making candles yourself. And, and it's that type of, rudimentary technology the fundamentals that you'll need to be able to to do this and they'll teach you about gene splicing mm -hmm. and uh, because the uh the, i wish i could remember the exact technology it won a, a nobel prize a couple of years ago uh, but the advent of this we're just at the beginning of of this technology and what it's going to do it's going to change medicine it's going to change i believe human evolution in in some ways um we're just beginning to see it as its applications for treating disease um, and also, you know, birth defects, mm -hmm. what, you know, pre-designed, pre-ordained uh, events. So I, I really think it's fascinating. And I think anytime you see this kind of new technology, this new science come out and, and it gets in the wrong hands, I, I find it really interesting. So yeah, it's quite a departure, but I have this idea for a story involving that where somebody sets out to do something very good and winds up going very wrong. Yeah, it feels very Bradbury. <laughs> yeah, it does, right? In a way. But you know, the best of those sort of stories, I feel like, you know, Bradbury's particularly are, they remain human stories, you know? Yeah. Those are the, it's kind of like my favorite zombie films are, you know, real human stories, right? Like 28 Days Later, I just love yeah. that film, you know? Because uh, you really become invested in those characters. And it's not just, a, uh, you know, nothing against World War Z, which I also enjoyed. Mm -hmm. But, you know, it seems much more intimate, you know, the story mm -hmm. when you're talking about characters. Always goes back to character. Char Character-driven work sells. <laughs> yeah. You know, it does. You know, I was talking to somebody yesterday about it. And um, she's a producer. She actually teaches out at the University of North Carolina in graduate program in creative producing. Wow. And uh, she's very accomplished. She produced Zookeeper's Wife, uh, a film I loved with Jessica yeah. Chastain. And, um, and Kim, you know, we were talking about TV and the things that, you know, what I find most exciting today, really, um, it's like I just watched The Queen's Gambit win an mm -hmm. Emmy Award, right? <laughs> you know, 
stop and think about it for a second. In, you know, a couple of years ago, a few years ago, can you imagine like a Queen's Gambit number one even reaching the airwaves of like a, a, a you know a major network? No, I couldn't. Mm-hmm. You know, uh, I don't feel like those. I feel like now we're starting to to realize that. Uh, the audience, right? All of us who are audience as well, you know, we crave story, we crave good story. And I, you know, it, it just, if you can just deliver good characters with good story, you will find viewers, you know? That's, I think that's the the key to it. It's always been the key. And I think it's, that's the sort of renaissance that we're seeing right now with streaming, you know, and what works is good story and good character. You know, that's it. That's simply it. You know, so we're going to sit around. We're going to watch a show about chess. You know, uh, a young woman who's who's been through a harrowing, you know, upbringing and is a drug addict. You know, and it's like, yeah, I, I don't see that playing at primetime NBC. <laughs> yeah. You know? uh, right. You know, and 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 look at it now. You know, so I love it. I, I really do. I I uh, I just think it's very exciting. Some of the stories that are being told. You know, and, and you're seeing a lot more uh, filmmakers get the opportunity to not only write, but, you know, direct mm-hmm. and sort of you know, create these worlds. Yeah. Um, May Destroy You. I don't know if you've seen that. Um, yeah. HBO. Have you seen it? It's it's amazing. Yeah. It's amazing. She is so talented. It blows your mind. OK, she's she wrote, you know, starred in it. It's, just, it's crazy. And so I'm excited where uh where entertainment as a whole is going the tides are turning <laughs> oh big time right i feel like it's a tidal wave i think it is i you know because again it just it's so fundamental it's not like um there's been a dramatic shift in in, in society it's just like you allowed good stories to be told you know and you realize oh that's all they ever wanted in the first right. place. That's all we've ever craved, right? Is just good yeah. storytelling, you know? Get us in the get us in the tent. That's what they used to tell me in reality TV, right? In the very early days, my bosses, when I used to have to write teases and stuff like that. Oh, I'm sorry, I got a couple of <laughs> It's okay. All right. Uh, when, when I used to write teases, right, for uh, reality TV and that mm-hmm. sort of thing, my bosses you got to get them in the tent you got them in the tent and i never understood what they were talking about but you know like those carnival barkers of you know sir you know come see the bearded lady right. you know and that sort of thing you just gotta you gotta interest them you gotta grab their attention bring them into the tent and once you're in the tent you know then you can start to deliver right and so i just i'm i'm really grateful that we've made that that sea change yeah definitely a, a more positive and more creative future for for entertainment at the moment yeah yeah i think so i think there's a huge amount of opportunity out there i really do you know again you know there's a lot of barriers that that you have to get past you know it's like who are the arbiters of taste who are the people that are gonna you know champion your work you know and that's something that i ran into i think everyone has to run into at some point you need somebody an advocate on your side whether it's a manager it's an agent a producer somebody who will you know stand up and say this is relevant this is mm-hmm. good this you know work um that's why like i i, I talk to people quite a bit about it about screenwriting competitions they can really help you get recognized you know somebody to say hey this is worth reading, you know, and that's kind of what you need. You need that somehow you need you need to get your work out there. Absolutely. And I think with that, um, it's an excellent, we started with the Starling and we ended it with an excellent lesson for, for up and coming screenwriters and, and just creatives. Yeah. Storytellers for sure. Yeah. yeah. It's a it challenge. is. Um, thank you again so much for, for taking the time to sit down with yeah, us. Anytime. Thank you. You bet. Have me back. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you. I hope you have we'll a talk good day. Good luck. Thank, thank you. you. Right, you Bye-bye. Bye-bye.